Oh, that's so nice. Thank you so much, John. That's the first order of business is to thank John for allowing us to be part of Spiritual Spaces as a patron. Um, and Betsy Gwynn, of course, their executive director. I'm just really uh, grateful for them and their leadership. We are a little bit of a different animal, Gladdening Light. John alluded to us. Um, how many of you have been to a Gladdening Light event? Anything? Well, great. Gladdening Light is a spiritual arts nonprofit. We're a 501c3 based here in Winter Park. We were formed in 2008. And we exist to celebrate the nexus, the intersection of art and spirituality. So everything we do has a bent toward both of those components, art and spirituality. We do an annual symposium now here at the college. We just finished, it's the, normally the last weekend in January. And this past one we brought filmmakers in and an Oscar winning composer, a film critic with the New York Times, to talk about the movies and how they move us spiritually. And it was really fun. Uh, next year, we're gonna be back at Rollins at the end of January, so stay tuned for um, an announcement on that. We also do retreats. Uh, occasionally, we'll do uh, a smaller thing where we take 30 or 40 people to a space out in the country and we put writers and uh, artists and theologians together to talk to us and it's more of a, of a personal journey. And we do some trips. Uh, we've taken trips with Dr. Anna Heller at the Cornell to New York and Washington to look at art and talk about how it moves us. Um, so additionally, the, the thing that maybe distinguishes us even further is that we are patrons. Occasionally we'll underwrite museum exhibits or help um, you know, with spiritual spaces as an example. So uh, we're a patron of the Bach Festival and that partnership has endured ever since we uh, began the program called Voices of Light. I don't know if any of you saw that, the film about Joan of Arc that John performed live to. That was quite special. So that's a little thumbnail about Gladdening Light. Um, I want to start maybe a little bit unusually for you. I would like to start with some quiet time, okay? If you would all put both feet on the floor and just put your hands in your lap. And we're gonna do something that one of my professors um, called squared breathing. And it's just gonna be about a minute, just to kind of get us centered here. So um, if you think of wind as spirit and breath, uh, there are four pulses to each of these four things that make up the square. The first is to the heart at rest, then the inhale, a hold of the breath, and then the exhale. So I'm just gonna walk you through it. So let's start with the heart at rest. Inhale. Hold. Exhale. Rest. Inhale. Hold, exhale, rest, inhale, hold, exhale, rest, amen. Okay. Now, this is not an academic lecture. This is a, a, a quixotic, was what I call it, appreciation of vocal music. And it's admittedly biased because I'm a white male Westerner. Uh, I'm a Christian, uh, but I consider this a journey of joy. So I hope that you get some joy out of the next few minutes with us. I wanna start with a quote from Victor Hugo who I admire so much. Um, he talked about music as the vapor of art. It is to poetry what reverie is to thought, what fluid is to solid, what the ocean of clouds is to the ocean of waves. Victor Hugo. Now, I feel like I'm 
somewhat of the same ilk as most of you here, uh, generationally. Although I see a lot of, a lot of people younger than I am, but maybe you can, uh, can take this journey together with us. How many of you remember the Swingle Singers from the 1960s? I think they're still around, actually, but it seemed like they were really popular in the 60s. Okay, the Swingle singer, Singers came from France, and they were a mixed, unaccompanied group of men and women uh, who used to sing on variety television programs um, unaccompanied. And so it was a real fun way to sing, and they used to scat, and they would sing you know, phonetic sounds and things, and they had this beautiful blend. Well, a as a child, I mean, that was my first introduction to unaccompanied music outside of church. And it was just so lively and fun. Um, so uh, the Swingle Singers led me kind of down this path that uh, initially began with the Mamas and the Papas, you know, which, I, I mean, if you Google like the greatest harmony groups of all time, and the Mamas and the Papas pop up there because of those two men and two women who just, you know, Mama Cass kind of coordinated that, that blend. And of course, the Beach Boys. We were all looking to California in the mid-60s, and the Beach Boys and Brian Wilson had that beautiful blend. Um, Simon and Garfunkel on the other coast, uh, you know, two singing as one. And for me, I mean, the, the, the sort of the apex, the zenith was Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Uh, if you think about that acoustic blend of Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and that one iconic song, Sweet Judy Blue Eyes, it was an homage to Judy Collins. Um, I mean, who can forget, you know, thrill me to the marrow, you know, when, they, when Graham Nash would hold that high note. Um, for me, that just gave me chills. And I, I, I kept wanting to dig deeper and deeper into uh, unaccompanied music and that harmonic blend. Um, you can't have this conversation either without talking about the Beatles. So, um, you know, the Beatles have to to be part of that conversation because, pardon me. Because the Beatles, um, you know, knew each other so well and, you know, really, really breathed as four people in, in one voice, in one breath. Now, what was it in the blend that captivated us so? Um, it's somehow in the 60s, differentiated from, say, the Everly Brothers or the Jordanaires who used to back up Elvis Presley. Um, I would venture to guess it was, it was almost like a counterculture testament of independence that this sort of acapella music um, beckoned us to a new path forward. Now, as with all new paths that feed our inmost passions, there are roots. What follows now reflects, you know, as I mentioned, a personal odyssey, um, but it's also a corresponding existential, spiritual journey that started with popular music and dug deeper and deeper. Um, so with apologetics, take, uh, leave what you will as you will as we move into this. Now hearing the Swingle Singer's vocal sandwich <laughs> led me to the beauties of the European choral tradition. And for many of us, you know, when we first dipped our toe into the European choral tradition, it was by way of the Vienna Boys Choir, uh, especially, you know, back in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, so their angelic sound, you know, is prepubescent before the, you know, the voices changed. And it really sent us to, to higher heights. Um, nice, yet, you know, we wanted more. You know, we want to dig even deeper. And... When we dig deeper, we are led inevitably to the glory of the English church. Um, and what I call Tudor polyphony, from the Tudor era of the English kingdom. You wet your whistle on the Vienna Boys Choir, and then you move to the Fountainhead. Composers like William Byrd, Thomas Tallis, Orlando Gibbons, and a minor favorite of mine, Richard Ferrant, who composed anthems within newfound Anglicanism to and from Catholicism. It was a time when the church was moving back and forth to Catholic and 
uh, Anglican rule, and uh, from English to Latin and back again. So it was, it was a very fluid time with respect to liturgy. But the, the SATB, the center, soprano alto tenor bass melodies, were designed to soar to those high vaults of the cathedral spaces in England. So you had a lot of space and air in these, in these compositions. And there was a soothing ethereal uh, constant to the music, uh, usually unaccompanied, a cappella, which means in the manner of the chapel, that touches me and I think touches a lot of you deeply. Uh, the highs, the soprano and tenor lines with underpinnings of vibration from the bass and alto lines have a decidedly visceral effect. I mean, they hit you in the gut. Um, and these anthems are most often sung during communion at church. So the sacramental act of partaking of the body and blood of Jesus uh, carry our entire beings into a transcendent realm. You know, this, this sacramental act and the music combined. The soul becomes married to the music that communicates with us in deeply spiritual, nonverbal ways. And as much as orchestras and symphonies might endure us, the heart is exalted in personal space for communion with the voice. I'm like you, I know all of us love orchestras and symphony uh, components, but there's something about vocals that resonate personally with us. Um, I also like to think of the English Romantic poets as having a foothold in all of this. Wordsworth, John Keats, Shelley, William Blake, Coleridge, the land from whence they came, the Lake District, uh, the rolling Lake District where madrigals sang gaily of love in the Renaissance village and the poetic attempted to triumph over Descartes in this idea of Cartesian uh, rationalism. The Romantic poets cleaved to the spiritual sounds of their natural world beyond the church walls, the brook to the field to the hill and vale. And don't have us forget also the Elizabethan majesty of the English Bible and the prayer book, the rhythms of the King James translation in particular, and Thomas Cranmer's Book of Common Prayer, moved the populace from the opaque Latin, uh, which was not understood widely, to an accessible English vernacular. So all of this wellspring of language, poetry, nature, sound, and intellect is foundational to the Anglican choral tradition. And Catholics stretched even further back to Gregory the Great and monastic chant, the birth of European Renaissance polyphony, newfound complexity in harmonic structures. When one digs for sources of discipline, spiritual hymnody, the search must begin in the time of St. Gregory, founder of the medieval monastic orders of St. Benedict and the medieval papacy. Gregorian chants sprang from the Jewish cantering tradition and Christian plain song of the early church, sung in a monophonic group setting central to the daily offices, before sunup to after sundown and to the mass on holy occasions. Influenced by the circadian liturgy of the hours, the rhythms of Gregorian chant were the foundation of monastic daily life and worship. How many of you remember the Benedictine monks of Santo Domingo? Okay, they had that great CD in the 80s and 90s called Chant uh, that we all you know, cleave to. Um, and it prompted me later, you know, I was a fan of, of chant, as we all were, but it prompted me later to pick up something that jumped off the, the record shelf to me, a CD called Beyond Chant. And Beyond Chant was um, a production of Dennis Keene and the Voices of Ascension, uh, New York City's Ascension Episcopal Church on Fifth Avenue. 
And if you, if you want to go out and just buy one CD of great Renaissance polyphony, buy Voices of Ascension Beyond Chant. I mean, it's a perfect introduction to a whole variety of polyphonic music. Um, the merging ebb and flow of eight to 16 part harmonies uh, by the likes of Palestrina, who was considered the Italian Renaissance master of the, of the style, the polyphonic style. His uh, peer from Spain, uh, Luis Victoria, and the French Flemish composer, Josquin Depré. Now, polyphony uses counterpoint to introduce multiple harmonic lines layered one upon the other and lends the melody to different voices in the register all within the same piece. Intricacies abound as sounds pleasing to the ear weave in and out of contemplative composition. Note, I say contemplative, because as much as you surrender to the straightforward plain song breathing, that essence of breathing of Gregorian chant, you can't keep up with polyphony. You absolutely, you, it's, at some point, you must eventually let go and just enter the music because it's so complex. There's so many things starting and stopping. Um, polyphony wants to enter you and enchant you at a cellular level um, and elevate your subconscious to higher realms. I mean, how many of you just in the past performance last hour wanted to close your eyes or perhaps assume this posture of devotion that we did with the squared breathing with your hands folded inside spiritual spaces tonight? I mean, it's, it is, it's a musical meditation. It's a beautiful thing. Precisely the ideal of letting go that encourages immersions into pieces like Palestrina's Sicut Cervus. Sicut Cervus is Latin for as the deer, Psalm 42, as the deer desireth the water brooks, so longeth my soul after thee, O Lord. Melodies commence again and again with various vocal parts, as many as 16 in classic ensemble choirs, from some great conductors like Dale Warland and the Dale Warland Singers out of Minnesota. He's retired now. John Rutter's Cambridge Singers, the Talis Scholars conducted by Peter Phillips, who have actually performed at the Bach Festival, and of course our own choir with John Sinclair. When music makes you cry, that's entree to the spiritual. These are the tears of the Holy Spirit, the advocate who holds your hand, beckoning, come. Enter the tender space, unafraid, as a child who takes the hand of a mother, trusting, following in a spirit of bliss, ready to be enchanted. Here's a coda from the German poet and literary critic Heinrich Heine. The very existence of music is wonderful. I might even say miraculous. Its domain is between thought and phenomena. Like a twilight mediator, it hovers between spirit and matter, related to both, yet differing from each. It is spirit, but it is spirit subject to the measurement of time. It is matter, but it is matter dispensing with space. Thank you for your kind attention. Enjoy the music. Thanks.